there we are. You want me to start as is? Because it says recording live on Facebook. Yes, so uh, good morning, everyone. So good, good morning, everyone. Uh, happy to have you today uh, in another uh, great session. Uh, so today we are going to talk about a very interesting topic uh, with uh, Dr. Conti from uh, Malaysia. So happy to see you, Dr. Conti. And uh, today's session is, uh, uh, will be very exciting and interesting because uh, uh, it addresses or it, uh, it focuses more on the common mistakes uh, that we have in our language classrooms and how to address them. Uh, you know that uh, teachers uh, or mistakes will happen, uh, you know, uh, anytime, no matter how we do, no matter how we, uh, uh, you know, uh, try to address them, but they happen uh, for some reason. And today's session, we will shed some light on this with Dr. Conti. So happy to see you again, Dr. Conti, and welcome to everyone academy. Uh, as I told you before, uh, our mission is to bring educators together and to learn from each other. Uh, welcome again. So feel free to uh, introduce yourself to the Moroccan audience and uh, then you can share your presentation. Fantastic. First of all, thank you Aziz for inviting me. It's such a pleasure to be here. Thank you. It's such a great initiative and uh, I'm particularly uh, particularly happy because uh, one of my best friends that I worked with for many years was from Morocco, which I just told you that, Mustafa, he was uh, an amazing guy and a great linguist. And he told me a lot about your beautiful country. So I'm here to uh, talk to you about uh, um, common mistakes commonly made in, uh, in, um, in the language classroom. A couple of words about myself. I was a teacher for many years, uh, about almost 30. And uh, I, at one point, I started to blog about language learning after many years of teaching. I'd been uh, um, a lecturer at university for a few years. I did my master's in uh, TEFL, teaching English for a language at Reading University. And then I did an Oxford Reading a PhD in uh, Oxford University, Reading University PhD in uh, uh, applied linguistics. Uh, I focused this more specifically on uh, something called metacognition, which is knowledge of yourself and how you can apply knowledge of yourself and knowledge of your students to improving. Um, after the PhD, I went to Malaysia to teach. And after uh, about 15 years of teaching in Malaysia, I started a blog called The Language Gym, in which I, I, mainly, I mainly speak uh, about, I mainly write about uh, issues with modern languages, French, uh, Spanish, German, and Italian teaching. But for some uh, reason, which, all good. Uh, the British Council, the English wing of the British Council, started to give me awards, uh, um, meaning that at least uh, some aspects of it are applicable to um, uh, teaching English as a foreign language. And uh, I wrote three books on um, uh, basically language teaching, a language teacher toolkit, a book called Breaking the Sound Barrier about which I'm going to talk uh, a bit more later, and another book, Memory, which has just come out, Memory, What Every um, Language Teacher Should Know. It sounds a bit like, a bit arrogant, but you know, it's, uh, I think it's quite a, a helpful uh, book. I wrote all of them with the fabulous Steve Smith, who has a great blog um, called, uh, well, it was called The Language Teacher Toolkit, but he changed his name every three or four years. And um, I work at the moment extensively as a CPD provider. In other words, I go around the world. I do about 100, 150 workshops around the world a year. I usually do Australia, England, Europe, Southeast Asia. I still haven't done Morocco, but I've done other parts of the Middle East. I've done Abu Dhabi, Qatar. I've done uh, um, the um, Dubai. And uh, at the moment, I am uh, doing a lot of book writing, um, mostly French and Spanish, in which I'm applying all the ideas that are going to discuss today. I'm quite controversial in the field, 
So you'll find that a lot of people don't agree with me. So whatever I'm telling you, don't think it's coming from some superior being who knows more than you. I'm just a teacher who did a lot of research and applied the research to the classroom. So don't take every single word, as I said, um, as a Quran or gospel truth, okay? It's just Gianfranco Conti telling you my take on research. And that's what you should always do with research. There's no answer which is 100% correct, even if they tell you it's evidence-based. Take what you think it's good for you, apply it to the classroom. If it works, keep it. If not, just throw it away, okay? So if you're okay with me, with, uh, with this, um, uh, Aziz, I will just share my screen. Yes, yes. Yes, you can share your screen. Yes. Fantastic. Cool. I said host disabled participant screen sharing, Aziz. Okay, you now. You need to uh, allow yes. me. Yeah, you need to allow me. Can you try At again? At the moment, I cannot. Try again now. Okay, wait. Nope. It says host disabled participant screen sharing. That's the message I'm getting. Try it now. Okay, still. Really? Because here it, it is it is activated. Uh, I don't know. It says uh, when I try, it says. Oh, now I can. Brilliant. Yeah. Thank you, Noah. You're a legend. So, I think it's this one. Yes, it is. There we go. Now, before I start, a little disclaimer. A little disclaimer, and the disclaimer is that uh, uh, this is normally something that I do in much uh, longer time. It takes me about four or five hours. So I narrowed down the commonly made mistakes to five, but normally I talk for much longer than that. Also, uh, although I'm, a I'm trained as a TEFL teacher, I mostly do my workshops dealing with French, Italian, German, and Spanish. So the examples will be mostly uh, in French, some in Spanish, which is okay because it's one of the languages that all Moroccan teachers anyway speak quite fluently. So the idea is that you will get the concepts behind it anyway, and then you can apply them to English as you please. So as you can see there, it says clearly, it's a cognitive theory based approach. It's all based on cognitive theory, which is a, uh, a, a branch of uh, uh, cognitive psychology, which um, I will uh, discuss and touch upon as I go along. So these are the books, a little bit of shameless advertising here. If you wanna know more, these are the books where you can find um, a bit more about what I'm going to tell you now. So the mistake, the first mistake that I'm really passionate about, and this is very controversial, it's single word teaching. That is a mistake. Let me qualify mistake. It's a mistake if you are dealing with beginners to intermediate students who still don't have a strong mastery of the patterns of the language. If a student cannot build a sentence together, giving them just single words can be quite problematic because they won't know how to glue them together. So what I'm gonna talk about and what I always uh, advocate when I talk about my approach is the sentence patterns should go first. So this is what you used to find in a lot of books in England, Australia, all over the world, single words lists. Um, I'm gonna argue against that. And before uh, I, I talk about this, I'm gonna give a little very short intro about working memory, about cognitive science. This is straight from the book that I just published on memory. So, working memory is basically the part of your brain situated, located in the prefrontal cortex and is your processor. If you were a computer, it would be your processor and your REM, your, um, the capacity, how, ma how many data your computer can handle at any one time. I'm not gonna go into the detail of what working memory is, but the main thing that you need to know about working memory is that it is basically where you process reality, language, everything you do in your daily life consciously. 
So for instance, when you swim or when you ride the bike, you are not thinking consciously. You're not processing consciously because you're just using automatic skills, right? We call it procedural memory. So that doesn't go through working memory. But when you're learning a language, when you're learning a language in the classroom, for instance, a grammar rule, or you're trying to work out the meaning of a sentence that is not familiar, then you are using working memory. Working memory is the space in your brain, which is dedicated to conscious decision-making and problem solving. But there's a problem. The big problem that you need to know as teacher about working memory is that it's a very, very, very primitive mechanism. It's not good for somebody in the 21st century. Not good at all. Why? Because it's very limited. For instance, just to give you an idea, any formation that we try to learn stays in the brain only 15 seconds. One, five, and then it goes. And if you see here on my slide, something called sensory memory. So sensory memory be means anything that gets into us through our ears, eyes, mouth, through our senses. Now, weirdly enough, any image that we see through what we call visual spatial sketch pad, which is the our inner eye, and anything that we hear only lasts in our brain for two seconds, only two, and then it's gone. And the scary thing is that the slightest distraction makes us forget. And now I wanna invite you to do a little experiment with me. Before doing that, don't be scared. When you do this kind of experiments is some people do better than you. Unfortunately, and this is a big problem, or fortunately for some, some people are born with four gigabyte, some people with eight gigabyte, and some people with 16 gigabyte. You need to understand how to recognize the children in your classroom with four gigabyte, with a very small working memory. These are the kids that will ask you to repeat things twice or three times. These are the kids they start doing an essay, but they can, or they start writing something, but they forget what they're gonna say next. These are the kids that very often you think are naughty, but they're not naughty. They just don't get it. They need more explanation, more repetition. And it's a, it's a science. If you go in my book, for instance, we have a whole uh, section dedicated to recognizing this case. This is the experiment, okay? An experiment I do all the time with my audiences and guess what guys I always get the same result I'm gonna measure your working memory capacity how many words you can keep in your brain so let's do this experiment of course I can't hear you but you can hear me I'm gonna follow the same pattern on that slide I'm gonna say in a very funny language one then I'm gonna say two then I'm gonna say three then four, then five, then six. And what I want you to do is repeat it aloud in your room, wherever you are, or just in your head. But when you repeat them, you have to repeat them in the sequence. First one, then you say one, two, then you say one, two, three, then one, two, three, four. When you fail to remember the sequence correctly, that will be the limit of your working memory. Okay, I hope it's clear. The language is called John Frankies. Nobody talking, so don't worry. I need to learn it. Right, let's start. Repeat after me, okay? Remember, when I say one, you say one. When I say two, you have to say one, two. And then one, two, three. Don't just repeat the last number, okay? Right. Enoch. Wadesh. Ertoch. Watroshk. Et penar. Now, most of you will have failed at three or four. Am I right, Aziz? How uh, many did you remember? No, no word. <laughs> <laughs> so the idea is that you can usually remember only a sequence of four if you're smart. Otherwise, you will have stopped it about three. Why? 
This refers to the cognitive law theory principle of the narrow limits of change. The narrow limits of change principle say that you can only process four words at any one time, or rather four units of information. This is very important, four units of information. So if you teach single words, your kids will be able to process, especially the poor ability ones or the ones who are uh, less focused, they'll be able to only deal with three or four words if you teach single words. So imagine a sentence like, uh, I, like this one in Spanish. In English, I like my mother a lot because she is nice. Now, madre is feminine, so this should be simpatica. But many kids don't do that, are not able to do that. Why? Because if you can only handle three to four words at any one time, they remember not to make it agree. So another type of double mistakes is when they forget to say the verb, my parents good, my parents nice. Or when instead of saying, hier yeah, je suis allé au cinéma, we'll say, hier yeah, j'ai allé au cinéma. Why? Because unfortunately, the issue very often is not grammar. They know the grammar rule, but the issue is they cannot handle many words, not more than three or words at the same time. This means that a lot of grammar mistakes or syntactic mistakes that these kids make or pronunciation mistakes are not due to the fact they don't know the grammar, but they don't have the space in their working memory to apply the grammar. So correction very often is absolutely useless because it doesn't address the issue. The issue is what we call in psychology, processing inefficiency. My brain cannot handle too many things. And guess what, guys? There's another problem which I'm gonna tell you about now. This is the, the way I was taught to teach languages, single words. I would go in my flashcards. Hey, I would, I would shout, and the kids would repeat after me, which is a bad thing. Don't get your kids to repeat after you unless they're pro in terms of pronunciation. I'll tell you about that later. That's another mistake. Now, what I would do then, I would teach them all my, uh, uh, clothes in French, and then I'd say, okay, guys, now I'm going to teach you adjectives in French. How exciting. Some of them are masculine, some of them are feminine, yeah? The nouns, you notice that? Yeah? You notice that? Cool. Now, adjectives, first of all, in French, go after the noun. You don't say un bleu manteau, you say un manteau bleu, un manteau blanc. Un manteau gris. And guys, don't worry. So that's rule number one. The adjective goes after the noun. Rule number two, guys, super easy, don't worry. In French, adjective, go to the feminine just, just by adding E in the end. You see? So, une sharp bleu, une sharp gris. Sir, yes, how about blanche? Okay, blanche is irregular. So now you have three rules. It goes after the noun. It had any, and there are some irregular ones. Sir, yes. How about orange rouge? They already have an E. Do you add another E? No. Rule number four. If it ends in E, it stays with an E. Sir, yes. How about marron? How about marron? Uh, marron doesn't add anything. Why? Because it's a fruit, and fruit don't change. So these poor kids, just to put two words together. They need to remember five, five grammar rules, five. And we said that the limit, narrow limits of change principle says three or four. So on top of learning the clothes and the adjectives, they need to handle, no wonder, a lot of kids cannot do languages because we are making language learning like learning a mathematical formula and apply it kids with a poor working memory. Instead, imagine you have, this is quite complex because it was for a very good group that I used to teach, but imagine you, you teach them chunks, not just one word, single words, but you teach them a chunk and you make sentences like, je porte une casquette blanche, je porte un chapeau blanc, 
je porte une chemise grise, je porte un, une cravate violette. Number one, they learn the language in context. Two, they're hearing it, they're processing it through many games that I talk about in my book. You are bombarding your students for an hour with je porte un cas une casquette blanche, je porte un chapeau blanc. They're learning it the natural way through listening like your kids do at home with you. And guess what, guys? If I hear for an hour, une ceinture marron, une chemise rose, une chemise violette, do I need to learn that the adjective in French goes after the noun? I don't need it, do I? Because I heard it one hour, two hours, for two lessons before I started to speak. Before I started to speak. Because the trick is, just like you do in real life, there's no rush to speak. Kids take ages. They listen for 100, for, for 4,000, 5,000 hours before we speak. Our kids need to speak at the end of the lesson. Like you would say, it's a sin to be silent. And guess what, guys? If they keep hearing une casquette blanche, une casquette grise, why on earth would they want to say une casquette blanc? Why? Why would they want to say une casquette uh, vert? Because you're using listening, the real root for learning languages, the real root, let me say it again, the real root for learning language, listening. So you don't teach, you need to teach rules because it's happening organically. We call it in psychology, the phenomenon of priming. Now, let me step back a second and go back to the experiment we did before. So here, we decided to teach chunks. Here, you can actually handle 15 to 16 words. Yes, working memory is funny. If you teach single words, we can handle only four. But if you teach chunks, working memory can handle 15 to 16. Do you understand the advantage? I'm teaching language in context. I'm doing it through listening, which is the natural way for acquisition. Three, most importantly, I don't even need to teach grammar rule because if I keep hearing the adjective there, it's going to be there. If I need to teach, if I hear the instead of the, or if I hear n instead of a, they don't have to apply the rule though, n before a vowel. They don't need to because they are learning in context. And there's an, this is an example of a chunk. Look, if I teach all those words, Je m'appelle Anne-Marie, j'ai Anna, je suis. I am teaching many words singularly, individually, and then they have to put them together. But how about this? This is one chunk. Why? Because I have je m'appelle plus noun, two, one chunk. J'ai Anna, two, second unit. Je suis plus adjective, three. So we are within the narrow limits of change. Remember, three to four items. So you can choose, teach single words, use websites that just teach you single words or use a smart website, a smart textbook, a smart curriculum where you're actually using working memory in the most efficient and effective way. Read that slide. Point three is very important. We know from research two things, two things which are really key and really persuaded me to change my approach because I was not trained like that. Number one, when we talk in real life, fluency is determined by a phenomenon called chaining. What researchers in fluency have identified and found out is that when you produce language as you speak, you produce chunks after chunk. And the only thing in between is a connective, usually and or but. So yesterday I went to the cinema. It was cool. I had a lot of fun. Uh, there was too many people. But you know what? I really enjoyed it. You can see the chunks. So the best way to produce fluency is that too. When we read and when we listen, fluency is determined by the ability of the reader or the listener to recognize and process large sections of a text. 
And the process is called ballistic processing. I'll, show, I'll talk about that in a bit. So, whoops. One theory, which is contra as controversial as me, called by Professor Michael Hoey. This is not controversial to me, but some people find it controversial because it's not falsifiable and other issues. But the main thing is this. We notice that kids, as they, in the first language, in the first few months of speaking, they only use one word. But then they switch after 12 months to something called pivot schemata. What is a pivot schemata? A pivot schemata is two words where you have usually a verb, but not always a verb, followed by a noun. For instance, your kids will say, want milk, want cake, want chocolate. You can see the pivot, yeah? The pivot is the verb. And now this pivot schemata then develop into full sentences. According to Marco Hurry, what happens is this, you hear words and subconsciously you record, for instance, with want, what words you hear more frequently. And then when you hear the word want, just like Google, what Google does, you activate subconsciously all the words connected with want. And then of course, based on the context, so there is a chocolate there, you'll say one chocolate. But every other word will receive what we call activation. This activation has different strength, depending on how often you use something or how often you hear something. Now, does single words prepare you for that? No, it doesn't. Because when you learn single words from a page, you're learning them completely out of context. So if you want your student to be effective readers and listeners, they need to hear chunks. They need to learn words in chunks, high frequency. You wanna test that? Let's do another experiment. This, you're gonna be my guinea pig, man. So you have to do it because nobody else can speak. So I want you to finish each sentence that you hear on the screen, okay? Right. Yes. Sit down, imagine you're a teacher. Sit down and open your book. You're not going to learn if you don't speak up. Don't worry about the exam. Just do your yes. excellent theory proved, right? Aziz said exactly what every single one of my 8,000 a year usually attendees say. Why? Is Aziz a genius? Aziz is a teacher, he's been in the classroom. So he knows that those words are more strongly associated with that chunk. Why? Because it's usage. The brain works like a machine, like AI. We record the things we hear more often and we say them automatically. Aziz didn't even have to think. Why? Because it's called ballistic processing. Ballistic processing is when something, a word, comes immediately after, automatically. For instance, uh, shut up your mouth. Come on, sit down and do your work. They are automatically retrieved by the brain. So, conclusion. Chunks prepare you for fluency in listening, reading, speaking, and writing. This. The most important thing I can tell you today. And these are big names, Paul Nation and Ellis. Not just uh, a Look at what Wilkins says. You can cover enough the time was expecting from a whole year of language learning. I open it for me and for a lot of people who are following my approach. What are chunks? Uh, guys, because of time, I'm going to be a little bit quick here. Chunks are basically these, according to the famous book by Michael Lewis, which I always recommend, The Lexical Approach. Any unit of meaning, from words to polywords, 
And the most important ones are collocations and colligations, which I'm going to mention in a bit. So a chunk is one of these. Of these. These. Like the one I showed you earlier in French. Je m'appelle Marie. Je dix ans. Je suis française. Now, the most important thing you need to learn about chunking, colligations. We teach grammar very often in terms of verbs and adjectives, but the most important colligation, most important grammar bit that you can teach is what patterns those words are put in. This is colligations. Colligations is how word form grammatically correct patterns with other words according to the standards usage of the target language. Collocations are instead word partnerships. Something like you can say, I make tea, but you cannot say, I do tea. You can say, I do my homework, but not I make my homework. So fluency is about being able to recognize and produce sequence of words as fast as possible. So chunking is, of course, the best thing you can do, presenting language through chunking and teach learners to chunk by themselves. This is a typical activity I do as listening. I shout basically uh, things that go in the blue section and they need to put them in the right thing. For instance, la vérité goes with je dis. So the kids will write la vérité. So it's a dictation kind of thing. Uh, je coûte une chanson and they have to put it right here. Mes devoirs, and they have to put it here. Uh, au basket, and they have to put it here. And there's many other activities in my book that you can have a look at. The idea is making sure that the most important schema, verb, plus what comes next is learn. Verbs are more important in a way than nouns for fluency because a sentence starts with a verb. The core bit is the verb. Now, look at this. This is a famous model by Levelt. Levelt is the greatest psycholinguist in the world. In the 80s, he came out with this model of how oral production is, uh, happens. I'm going to say very quickly. First, we come out with a preverbal message. And we do something called macro planning and micro planning. We think about the, what, what the, what the idea we want to convey is in psychology we call it proposition then what we do is we package it based on uh, who the audience is is it a, a formal audience is it my teacher is it my senior is it my junior and then the brain starts selecting the words what we call lexical selection in the brain i'm saying in very simplistic terms it's much more complex than that and then we do two things that i want you to pay attention to one functional processing. When we select the words, we need to put it in the right grammatical form. So is it an adjective? Is it the subject? Is it the actor, the agent, or is it the recipient? Because as you know, if it's an object or if it's masculine or if it's feminine, there will be issues, right? And then, or at the same time, we do something called positional processing. We put them in the right order. Now, Look at this V3, V4, and all the rest. This is, these are the vulnerabilities to fluency. In other words, if I have issues here, 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 or there, I slow down fluency. So if you teach single words, you're slowing down fluency because the child needs to think about what's masculine, what's feminine, the word order, and all the rest. Whereas if you teach chunks, you all these two processes are compressed in one because the chunk is ready made. So you don't have to think about word order. You don't have to think about many other permutations that you have to make. Where do we get the chunks from? In my approach from communicative language, communicative functions. I'm not gonna spend too much time here, but the idea is that when you structure, your, when you create your syllabus, you think about skills for life functions that you have to perform in life. So describing and identifying people. 
So for instance, a function could be, a micro function could be describing people's eyes and hair, describing people height and weight, describing, comparing people, yeah? So the idea is that based on these categories, which we call function or uh, um, communicative functions, you will then select the chunks that best describe it. For instance, comparing people, X is more Y than Z. That's a chunk. Or describing likes and decides, I don't like plus noun because plus noun or verb phrase. So the idea is that you teach chunks which relate not to some abstract category of grammar, but real life. I'm teaching my student to describe people. The grammar comes after, because then you wanna teach how to go from I to she and they, or you wanna teach them to use different adjectives, masculine rather than feminine, plural rather than singular. But the main thing is vocabulary rules in the form of chunk. Example of chunks, I need to go faster guys, but I think you get the idea. Yes. Let me speed through this. We are clear now about what a chunk is. So there are a lot of chunk teaching activities that you can do, which you'll find in my books if you're really uh, interested in it. Um, and I'm gonna give you some more during the, the course of the presentation, so don't worry too much. Now, problem number two and it's related to chunking. Insufficient focus on decoding skill. When I did my CELTA and my, even my masters, I was told no reading aloud. Reading aloud is not a communicative activity. It's not real life activity, you shouldn't do it. It's old school, you don't do it. And they used to say, don't worry about pronunciation as far as I understand you. I understand that with certain children, you shouldn't worry about pronunciation. But I'm gonna tell you something that might change your opinion. And it comes from the great prophet, Paul Nation. First of all, let's look at the benefits of reading aloud. All research based guys. We all agree on those. Let's look at the science of the brain, working memory. We know that in order to learn a new word, you need to be to repeat it aloud because everything in our brain happens through sound when you, lang when you learn a language. Language learning is all about sound. You need to assign a sound to the word. You can't learn words from a page silently. It's not the best way to learn it. But there's more, unless, unless students are given the chance to say a word or phrase several times, they may assign the wrong sounds of the word, which would be then a big problem because in England, in English, many words sounds very similar. Three, phonological short-term memory correlates with future L2 learning performance. In other words, the way we learn the sounds determines if you're gonna be a successful language learner and communicator. Why? I'll give you the science now. So in your brain, you have something called a phonological memory. In the model by Badley and Hitch, um, the most famous accepted model of working memory. So we have a device which we call the language learning device, which is according to their model, con consists of two uh, stores or two devices, two uh, mining uh, slave systems, a phonological store and the articulatory loop. Notice, notice that this loop is a metaphor. So imagine in your brain, your sounds, when you pronounce them, they go, they travel, your word travel, around this loop. But guess what? This loop is very limited. Remember, two seconds. Remember, I told you earlier, sound lingers in your head two seconds. Then you need to have to make it go on this loop several times over to memorize it and put it here. And when you put it in here, 
you then have two choices. You either say it or you store it in your long-term memory. Example, I'm learning a phone number. I go 017-622-4167, until it goes in here. And then you either say it or you memorize it. Now, why is it important? And it was a game changer for me. Because of course, if you can't pronounce words fluently, you cannot accommodate many words on this loop, right? You can't. So that meant to me that if I cannot accommodate many words on this loop, then I cannot memorize many, right? But if can I can accommodate 16 words, remember, four chunks, and I can say them fast, then it means I can learn more vocabulary. And guess what? Science says exactly that. Have a look at this. Learning the first 15 content words of a new language may take several hours, but after three months, three months of daily study, you can learn 100 new words. And you know why? Because you developed phonotactic fluency. In other words, the words now, because you had a lot of practice in reading and speaking, I say reading aloud, why? Because reading aloud is easier at the early stages. Kids cannot speak much, but they can read more, right? Because it's less taxing on working memory, it's less challenging. So doing a lot of reading aloud, develop phonotactic knowledge and fluency. It means that the children can accommodate on that loop more words, so loads of reading aloud. And guess what? Loads of listening. I'll tell you why loads of listening. By the way, look at this elo arrow here. This loop works even when your students are reading silently. So when you get them to read something silently that they cannot pronounce well, guess what? The, the brain is still gonna say it, which means that eventually they will learn bad pronunciation. So loads and loads of reading aloud, not big text, short text, or games like the ones that I'm gonna suggest now. Notice that in terms of speaking fluency, this is vulnerability five. A student who cannot pronounce, who hasn't had practice in pronunciation, won't be fluent because this is vulnerability five to fluency. If a student can't pronounce properly, the whole process grinds to a halt. And look how many muscles. Guy, look at that. I mean, honestly, look at that. Look at that. Look at that. How many organs, mean muscles, uh, different things we need to re-educate the mouth to do. So much. That's why it's so important the student do lots of listening. I'll tell you why. And loads and loads of reading aloud. Franco, reading aloud is boring. Good. I created loads of games, which are loads of fun. I'll just give you one or two. This is called mind reading. All you need is two students with two mini whiteboards or two pieces of paper, okay? They need to write three sentences each from the board and they need to do ping pong guessing. So uh, you write three sentences, I write three sentences, I'm hiding, you need to guess. So you will read to me, for instance, I don't know. Number two, gioco a carte perché è appassionante. I play cards because it's exciting. And I'll say, yeah, you got it, well done, tick. Then it's my turn to guess the other person. And you know what? It's fun. It takes zero, zero time to prepare. And thirdly, and most importantly, you don't need to be good at languages to win. And there's a lot of speaking practice. For beginners, it's great. But even for intermediate, if you're working with new uh, words, with new sentences, and guess what? It's all chunks. There's many more games that I cannot really go into because it's already late. Already spoken for nearly an hour. There's many more. I'll give you another one, which is super fun. The kids really love it. Imagine you've been working on a text, okay? 
Then what you do, you wanna do something which is extremely helpful for learning. One, of course, is what we just said, reading aloud. Two, repeated processing. You start with the text, it could be just sentences. And you read it, the, the kids now read after you, and now they have to continue reading. Each time you will have dropped more parts of the text until you'll find that the kids will have loads of fun, and will have memorized all of it. It's good fun. It's from Paul Nation. It's not my idea. It's called Disappearing Text. Point number three. I know your head is already aching. I know. I get that all the time in my workshops. No, no, no. Listening, listening is grossly ne neglected and doesn't model. This is the, the subject of my book, Breaking the Sound Barrier. You can see why I'm so controversial, guys. Now, look at that. For God's sake, look at that. Look at that. Isn't that scary? How many classrooms do exactly the opposite? Listening 45%, speaking 30%. You go in many classes of language classes around the world, and guess what? It's the other way around. Reading, <laughs> writing, a little bit of listening maybe, and a little bit of speaking. Look where the priority lies. The priority lies here. Because we listen. Unless you're Italian, we listen more than we talk. And guess what? In the literature, research, stated many times over, listening is the Cinderella skill. Nobody does it. Look at the stats. Findings, rather. It's scary because actually cross-modality transfer is high between listening and speaking. What does it mean, cross-modality transfer? For instance, speaking, sorry, listening, whatever you learn through listening can be reused through speaking. Why? For one reason, it's a recent acquisition of research. We found that when you listen to comprehensible input, as Mr. Krashen, Dr. Krashen always say, if you listen to comprehensible input, the brain is basically silently speaking. The brain is activating the same circuits that it uses when it produces languages, apart of, apart, of course, from the motor cortex, which we use, of course, to activate the muscles, the organs in the mouth. If you understand that, then you, may, you understand that, for instance, if you do a lot of listening to comprehensible input, you are teaching them decoding skills. You are teaching them pronunciation. And the most important thing, if you get them to listen to comprehensible input a lot, they will become better speakers, not just better listeners. But what does it mean, comprehensible input? Comprehensible input means that 90-80% of the words must be familiar. Careful. Careful. Familiar means not that they saw it two or three times. They heard them two or three times. They can easily access them. So it's not doing a little match up, a little activity, and then you do the listening. No. It means you do three, four activities, four games like the ones I described. Look, 90% is only for the few and 80% graveyard of comprehension and learning. And remember, another dimension of comprehensible input, how fast you speak, how fast you speak, how fast the kids hear. Do you understand that when you speak and then when you play, anything and native speaker speed the people who are listening to you are not 0.25 seconds behind you no 0.25 seconds so with beginners don't play the strategies game guessing words finding cognates that's bull give them things they can understand speak like the mother to a child a teacher is a nurturer not a tester 
thesis, a famous research piece by Embus, 1996. Have a look and tell me, tell yourself, is this what I see in my classroom? If I went into your classroom or in your friend's classroom, colleague's classroom, is that what I would see? Is that what I would see? In England, at least for those who haven't read my book or applied my stuff, my ideas, it's still like that. It's just something that you have to do. And it feels very much like a test. Remember the listening input is fragile because it's difficult. Listening is hard. And listening stays in your brain two seconds and then it's gone. And remember, your listeners are just one syllable, English syllable behind the speaker, 0.25 seconds. So it's hard to learn from listening. You need to make listening learnable by going against everything you've been taught. You've been taught that listening should be authentic. No, it shouldn't be authentic. It shouldn't be authentic. Because a mother talking to a child, she's not speaking at authentic native speaker speed. We're not in the mother tongue country, the target language country. We are in a classroom. And why am I telling you that? Because kids hate listening. There's a specific form of foreign language anxiety called listening foreign language anxiety. Would you believe that? Yeah. Would you believe there's loads of research on that? Guess why? Because students feel it's just like a test. You want to reduce anxiety, talk normal speed, manipulate, change the input to make it easier for them, prepare them for the listening by doing a number of listening activities first, break it down, think about the things they're going to find difficult. How can you facilitate that listening? because listening is key for learning. Remember that we learned languages through listening. This is very important. Listening is the natural route for the acquisition of a language, not reading, not writing. Listening is. Reading is a support. Teach to the eyes, like Professor Krashen says, teach to the eyes. What is the worst thing you can do to a, to a native speaker? Sorry, to a non-native speaker. Ask them to speak on the phone to a native speaker. We all hate that. Even I am mouth English. But as a child, as a young learner, I hated the idea that I had to speak to somebody I couldn't see. It's unnatural. Make it interpersonal. Make it like activities between you and the students. There's loads in my book. Avoid the native speaker on the phone effect. Remember, you hate it and you're a teacher. Imagine a student who needs to listen to a tape of somebody they know is an actor, it's not even real. And all they have to do is answer questions about what this stranger is saying and they cannot even see their face. Teach to the eyes, make sure they can see you. Make sure that what you say modeled by your lips clearly so they can learn the very important art remember or not remember that we listen to our eyes as the famous make like effect says we listen with our eyes let me go spe speedy through this make it a test ask yourself next time you teach listening or reading does it feel like that or does it feel like this? Because this one is a perversion of listening. That is a test. This is not the way you learn from your mother or father. This is not the way your kids learn from you. This is. So my book is about listening as modeling. Your listening starts a sequence that goes from modeling through your voice and your gestures and your face to speaking. That one is a test. Three out of five, two out of 10. It's quantified, it's judgmental. It doesn't lead anywhere. 
it leads only to preparing for an exam. That hardly gives you pleasure in doing listening. That's why kids from around the world roll their eyes when the teachers say, okay, let's do listening. And remember, kids cannot concentrate for more than 40, 45 seconds. Make your listening short. But let's understand listening. I was a PE teacher, physical education teacher, and a um, foreign language teacher. Because in England, when you train as a teacher, you need to do two things. So because I was quite muscular, bodybuilder, and they told me, all right, you can teach physical education, right? And you know what? As a physical education teacher, they taught me how to teach basketball, football, rugby, archery, whatever it was, step by step. They taught me that when I had to teach football, they needed to learn how to pass, how to run with the ball, how to look around special awareness, how to head, how to dive if you're Italian and you want to get a penalty. So the idea is that as a PE teacher, you teach the micro skill of football. Do we teach them? the micro skill of listening. Do we teach them how to throw, how to pass the equivalent in listening? No, we just give them a listening and say, all right, now go and answer the questions. Would you like to be thrown in the sea and say, right, now swim? Would you like that? Well, let's understand listening quickly because there's a lot to say and I've got very little time left. First, we listen to the sounds. Then we process the syllable of each word. Then we segment where the brain identifies the beginning and ending of words. Once we have identified the boundaries, the beginning and end of words, we recognize the words and we attach a meaning to the words. Then. We identify the grammar, we analyze, we recognize the grammar uh, which binds the words together. Um, is it masculine, feminine, plural, adjective, present, past? And then we relate, we identify, we work out the meaning of each sentence. Finally, we relate each sentence, all the sentences that came before and after. This is called bottom up processing. Can you see how many skills there are there? Can you see how many? Loads, yeah? And you'll be surprised to hear that the first five in real life, in a native speaker, in your language, a fluent person, will be about 600 milliseconds. Now look at this arrow. This we call top-down processing. So listening is a combination of both. Starting from sound, to discourse, applying all these different skills almost together at the same time. And then when this fails, when we don't recognize a word or two words are not necessarily very clear, we use what we call inferring strategies. We guess, we work out a meaning using context. This is what we teach our students, right? Use context, use your imagination, Guess in an educated way. Uh, look, look, look for, uh, look out for um, key words. Right. What we say in my approach in our book, you shouldn't do that. Too much of that, because this is guessing. It doesn't model language. Kids need to understand most of the words. They need to use bottom-up processing. They need to be trained in recognizing sound in recognizing syllable, in segment, segmenting, in understanding, recognizing vocabulary. So imagine teaching listening in a different way. Not just listen and answer question, but listen for all of these things. Another reason why listening is so difficult is because of a phenomenon called assimilation. Words modify each other. For instance, in French, je ne sais pas, je sais pas, or je ne sais pas, or in English, 
don't be silly. It's not don't be silly, it's don't be silly. That makes it harder for students to listen. So they need training on that. So imagine having activities which train the student skill. For instance, Foltieco practices phonological processing. What is Foltieco? I say, I, um, I have a friend, and then I say, I have a free end. What's the faulty echo? Sir, you said free end. The first time you said friend. Well done. That were, it's a typical listening activity you can do in two seconds in front of the class. Takes no time, no planning. That works for phonological processing. How about write it as you hear it? The kids have to write the words or sentences short. Remember, sentences that you say exactly as they hear them. So if you say, I have a friend, you underline friend on the board and say, write the word underlined as you hear it. And they will write friend rather than friend as it's actually spelled, if you know what I mean. Listen in bingo. You put some chunks on the board. This is Malay to English, yeah? But if you're teaching English to Moroccan, to Arabic or uh, to French, you will ask them to put the, for instance, uh, in this case, I will ask them to put the English and I will say it in Malay. I would say, Sayer Teruja, which is, I'm, I'm excited. And they will cross out, I'm excited. Remember, they will have written the words in here, in whichever order they like, on the mini whiteboards, on a sheet. And then the person who's got three in a row wins the first prize. Content reordering. This works on discourse building and mini building. You read something in French, for instance. This is all in English. And based on what you say in French, they need to reorder the text. This works on discourse building skills. This is gap translation. You have the, you say you speak in French. They have the English translation, Gianfranco, translation, translation. You cannot use translation. Yes, with beginners, intermediates, use translation. Why? Because it shows them the difference between the two languages. It can only be good. And it teaches them vocabulary more easily. We don't have much time to waste with pictures and all the rest very often. This works on many levels, on lexical retrieval, on parsing, on segmenting. This is my favorite. Guess what comes next? So you start a sentence, for instance, in French. You say, alors, hier, je suis allé au, and there on the mini whiteboard, they need to write, guess what word comes next? Hier, je suis allé au, some kids will write cinema. Some kids will write théâtre. Some kids will write park, and they'll show you. Everyone will show you. When you say montrer, they'll show you. And of course, you're testing grammar, aren't you? Because if somebody say la piscine is wrong, you don't say o oh, a la piscine, right? You say o oh, plus masculine noun. So this is what I'm trying to say to you. How about we teach listening like we teach a sport like basketball? How about we teach writing, reading, and speaking like we teach a sport like basketball or football? How? We isolate the skills and we train them through this kind of activities, like sentence puzzle, for instance. You say a sentence in the wrong order, and they have to write it in the correct order. Cinema, yesterday, I went, mother, with, and they have to write, yesterday, I went to the cinema with my mother. Imagine doing this every day. Isn't that teaching them grammar or parsing skills? Isn't that keeping them a focus, a learned attention, as we call it, psychology, on something they would normally not pay attention to? Imagine doing as a starter each lesson, saying sentence in the wrong order. You sensitizing them to uh, syntax, grammar, and of course, if you then move on to something to do with meaning, you will have focused on form and meaning at the same time. It is there's 260 60 activities of this in my book with Steve Smith, Breaking the Sound Barrier. A solution, more listening. Use text which contain comprehensible input. I missed the S. 
I had ADHD, I made lots of these mistakes. Use yourself as a source of input. Don't be afraid. It doesn't matter if your pronunciation is not perfect, but better to be you, the source of input, or one of your colleagues, if you think your colleagues have better pronunciation. But the idea is make it interpersonal, like a father, a mother with a child. Be the nurturer, not the tester, not the examiner. And be deliberate in your teaching. Okay, I'm doing listening today. What am I focusing on? I'm using this text. I'm focusing on the listening part, on the pronunciation of it. Maybe you're doing reading aloud. Maybe you're doing a faulty echo, or you're focusing on segmenting. So you write all the uh, every sentence without the spaces in between words. And then you say it, and they need to draw the lines in between words, for instance. That works on segmenting skills and more. Four, input doesn't model. Remember what I told you earlier. Ask yourself, does it feel like that? Does your listening feel like that? Or does it feel more like a test? I'm going to do a little experiment with you. You speak French, so you should be okay with it. You only got 40 minutes. So I'm, not, I'm not sure how much ground I'll be able to cover. This is Esperanto. I'm going to ask you five questions about this text. And I want to test something with you. Take five minutes. Let's do it four, three, <laughs> to answer those questions. Get a pen or pencil, or do it in your head. Answer the question to that paragraph. Four minutes, yeah? Okay, now let's check the answers. It's uh, 1,000, it's very far, not far from, sorry, oops, not far from, what am I doing here? Not far from Beijing. Where was it built? About 1,800 years ago. Why did they build it? To stop. The uh, Mongols, it can be seen from the moon. And what is the author hoping to do? Aziz, did you get your questions right, your answer right? Uh, I only focused on the numbers because I don't understand the language. Is it Italian, maybe? It, it's, it, no, no, it's Esperanto. It's similar to French. Oh. Anyway, it, the, this experiment I've done many times, Aziz, and guess what happens? When I remove the slide and I ask them, they all usually get the answer right because it's a, it's a mix of French and uh, other European languages. Guess what happens? Everyone understands the question, but when I remove the slides and say, how many words do you remember? They only say, luno, moon. Oh. Why? Because when you do this kind of activities, guys, the kids are not really reading the text. Most of the time, they are just focusing on answering the questions. You're not asking them to read the text in detail. You're asking usually to just answer the five questions. So normally the kids look at keywords and they just answer. You're better off asking them to translate it, to be honest, but I'm not asking you to do that. So what does this test say? It says that when a, norm when a child, a usual, a normal child does an activity like that where they have to answer five questions, they're not learning any language because they're only paying attention to questions is a perverse way of reading. They're not learning anything. And there's another reason why they're not learning much. And this is the next experiment. That's it. I'm gonna be my guinea pig, okay? I'm gonna ask you, to read that text in 40 seconds and 
try to make to summarize the main ideas okay and then you're going to tell me what they are <laughs> without looking at the slide okay so you have 50 50 seconds to look at it then i'm going to remove it and you have to explain to me what this 3r technique is okay 50 seconds from now And the time is up, <laughs> Aziz. So, Aziz. Yeah. I cheated. The real test is another one. How many mistakes did you see in that text? I didn't see the text. Are you referring to the uh, Esperanto text? So you were supposed to read the text. It's all right, it doesn't matter. So Aziz, when I do this test, I ask people to look at the meaning of it, and then I ask them to tell me what the mistakes in that slide are. Nobody usually noticed one, more than one or two or three mistakes. Why? The brain is very limited. If we ask somebody to look at the text, focusing only on the meaning like we did here, the brain cannot focus on the grammar, on the vocabulary, on the spelling, on the mistakes. It's called the split attention or divided attention effect. In other words, when your students are doing any listening comprehension activity or reading comprehension activity, they are learning nothing about syntax, grammar, spelling, vocabulary, pronunciation. Why? Number one, because as we said, they only have two seconds to process each sentence. But thirdly, and most importantly, because if you focus them only on meaning, they will only pay attention to meaning. This is huge implication for language learning, teaching and learning. It changed the way I teach listening. Because it means that unfortunately, if we keep giving students listening comprehensions like that, reading comprehensions like that, and we don't ask them to deliberately focus on pronunciation, spelling, vocabulary, grammar, and syntax in that text, the students won't learn much or even anything really. If we are using a text for listening or reading is because, not because we're preparing that from an exam, but because we're modeling speaking through listening and writing through reading. So what does that mean? It means that if you wanna use listening as modeling, and reading as modeling as an approach, you need to follow a number of steps. Principle number one, we said earlier, if you want your reading or listening text to model, it has to be 90 to 95% comprehensive. Principle two, input flooding. You need to make sure your texts have loads and loads of repetition of the same patterns, not single words, patterns. You need to do what we call input flooding, which means as the word suggests, that you are enriching the text. So if you're teaching the present perfect, you'll put loads of present perfects. And one technique that I use is called narrow listening, narrow reading. It means that you basically have four texts which are absolutely identical. For instance, look at this. My name is Marco. In my free time, I usually play chess. My name is Maria. In my free time, I usually play football. My name is Andrea. In my free time, I usually play football again. But then 
it changes there's, a, there's also tennis and basketball. So the idea is that you're using the same patterns. You have four texts, which are quite short, so the kids don't find it too challenging, especially beginners, but you can do also with intermediate or even higher. And the idea is that you're flooding your input because it's the same text five times over with just a few changes here and there. And the changes are there for a reason. You want to teach that a pattern, usually I play, can be, I usually play chess, I usually play football, I usually play uh, football and, and tennis. So you are repeating the same pattern. This, and repetition, we know, it's pivotal for learning. So this is one of the most important technique for um, modeling. Because just like a, a father and a mother, your input is repeating things, just like, just like a nursery rhyme, over and over again. The more you hear something, the more you're primed to say it. In other words, the fact that you're hearing it so often, if I then ask you a question, what do you play? It's already in your head and you will use the same pattern. This is called priming. So step number three, principle number three, thorough processing. Thorough processing is making sure that your tasks focus the students on every single word, just like translations and dictation do. Why? If you're putting a lot of perfect tenses, a lot of uh, determiners, a lot of uh, uh, future tenses, a lot of uh, I want to plus uh, the infinitive uh, um, uh, patterns, you want the students to notice them. You want the students to process them many times over. So the idea of thorough processing is that you're basically creating tasks which force the student to process each and every word many times over. For instance, this is called spot the missing detail. There are missing words in there. So when I read, I will say, for instance, venerdì scorso ho suonato la chitarra, poi ho scaricato giochi e canzoni da internet, e ho Ascoltato musica. The students are nailed to the screen when you read this aloud and they need to pay attention to every single word because I don't have a gap which suggests where the word is. This is thorough processing. It forces them to pay attention to every single word so that you prime them for learning. This is spot the difference. You read aloud this, but they are looking at this. So they need to spot the differences between what you're saying and what they're reading. Again, because they don't know what the difference is, they need to pay attention to every single word. This is faulty translation. I'm speaking in French, but they see the English and they need to work out what is wrong. For instance, I would say, je m'appelle Marco, J'ai 15 ans, j'ai les cheveux blonds et les yeux verts. Je suis petit, musclé et assez beau. Je suis sympathique, bavard et assez généreux. There you go. So the idea is that the kids have to pay attention to every single word. So that you announce their chances to be primed and their chances to notice. There are other activities that I can really, you know, again, uh, uh, yes, yeah, 722 already here. And I only have about 30 more minutes. So the other very important, uh, a very useful activity is the one I mentioned earlier, sentence puzzle. So I'm teaching Italian. I put the, sent the words in a random order. I put the English translation, but you don't have to. And you say the sentence in the right order. Faccio colazione. E poi faccio la doccia, for instance. And they need to write in the right order. So it's all about multiplying the chances for the students to process every single word. There's more activities. Finally, I mentioned multi-level processing. 
for the idea that I mentioned earlier, that if you want the student to learn, if you want a text to model, you exploit the text every single level, like I showed you earlier, all those levels. So we'll have an activity using a text, which ability, micro ability, listening or reading. Another staple of my approach is repeated processing, making sure that you stage activities that force the students to learn by processing a text many times over. For instance, best recording, another activity by Paul Nation. Best recording is when you ask the student to, in teams of three, to record on their mobile phone, for instance, a text. But you tell them, you got 10 minutes, you have to give me the best recording ever. You give them some criteria if you want of what best recording would be, would sound like, but you don't have to. The kids are working as a team and they only record the text when the three of them believe they all got the best one. And to make them work as a team, you could say that you're not gonna judge the individual recording, but all the three recording and average the grade, averaging the grade out. This is an activity also that I showed you earlier, repeated processing. I'm gonna, there's another activity for that usually elicit um, repeated processing. Any jigsaw reading or listening usually forces the student to listen or read several times over. There's more guys, but I cannot go into it. But to wrap it up, people, P-I-P-O, which is a, a, a naughty French word, people, is basically the framework for listening or reading as modeling. Before step two, reading a task, make sure that you have a substantive pre-reading session. Three, four, five, the more activities, the better where you prepare them for anything that is still challenging in the text. You want to, them to go there confident. Then make sure that you do all the things that I showed you earlier, if you can. Thorough processing, input flooding, multi-level exploiting. Make sure that the text is exploited at different levels. If you want them to learn from it, yes, you will need to prepare activities. But if you get my book, for instance, a lot of them are very easy to prepare. Three, make sure that you consolidate, especially when it's listening. Make sure that they have a, you have a phase after the text has been done and dusted, that you consolidate what was in there, especially with listening, because I said, everything disappears after two seconds when it comes to listening. Finally, have a pushed output phase, phase four. Make sure that you have opportunities for the students to use, reuse, what was in the text. This refers to what we call the generation effect or production effect. When a student uses something creatively, not just recalling, not just retrieval practice, but actually creatively, that consolidate the memory trace and deep processing usually happens. Another very important problem, and I'm gonna finish here guys, because I'm exhausted and the time is little, but there'll be time for questions. Insufficient and ineffective recycling. Now, look at this curve. Many people in England, also thanks to me because I've been spreading this on the media, but it's a famous study that dates back to 1886. It shows how quickly we forget. Look, after 20 minutes, we lost already 42% of what we learned. 42%, look, it's huge, 42%. And after one day, 67% is gone. And when you think about your students doing not just French or English or whatever, but also maths, geography, history, at the end of the day, even if you are a super teacher, they will have forgotten a lot, not just because of time, but also because of the interference of all the other subjects, plus all their problems with their parents and with their girlfriends and the toys and the mobile phone and the shoes and the other problems that you can have in families who have social uh, issues, you know, deprived underprivileged kids and all the rest. So we need to think 
that memory is not something that you should take for granted because look at that curve after 31 days without recall you lose 79 percent the problem is not just that the problem is that it's just also about how you recycle so many books focus and many of us focus on the lesson don't think about a lesson think about a pedagogic cycle Think about at least about the next five to six lessons, at least. Plan a stretch of five to six lessons and plan for when you're gonna recycle. Now, this is ambitious guys. I know that especially in Morocco, you don't have maybe the resources that other uh, uh, countries, uh, richer countries have. I know that in Italy also, we don't have the same resources as England, Australia or America. Um, in Italy teachers, uh, you know, struggle with resources. But if you do have the resources and if you have the support, a good curriculum should look like this. Where, forget it, don't worry about MS, MCF1 or MCF4, forget about that. Uh, this could be anything that you want to teach. It could be grammar, it could be a set of vocabulary. But the idea is that when you move to the next set of sorts, when you go from week one to two, week three to four, week five to eight, week, week nine to 11, you don't leave anything behind. Because you saw after 24 hours, you lose about 70% of what you learn, 60%, sorry, what you learn. The, I call this the staircase design. This means don't teach much, less is more. Focus on the items that you really, 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 really need to learn. By level B1 of the CEFR, all you do, all you need is about uh, 2,000, 2,500 words. So 500 words a year is enough. Cut them to the essential. Focus on long, strong, durable learning rather than on quantity. And make sure that this is the pattern, that you never leave anything behind. And then you have some time at the end of a unit when you bring it all together and you work on what I call, what uh, I call routinization, Paul Nation called fluency training. I was going to talk about that later, but I have no much time. So this is, for instance, the way I plan a unit. The ticks are all the recycling. I can't go uh, through it, but the idea is you never, you never leave anything behind. You are cognizant of the fact that there are a lot of kids who will forget 80% of what you learn, of what you taught them, because of this. And this is science. This is science. This is not just one guy. This has been proven by years and years and years of research, decades. And we know that we retain best when we practice spaced retrieval, space practice. In other words, when you go back to a topic over and over again. I'll give you an example. For instance, if you look at this uh, slide, this uh, diagram, for instance, we know that if you are uh, given an exam, an ex imagine you have a test in 10 days or 20 days or 30 days, the best interval, the best space at which you should practice, you should do a little test, should be 10 or to 20% of the interval. So if you have 10 days, 20% would be at least every two days. If it's 20%, at least every four days. So the idea is that at the beginning, you revisit every other lesson. And then when you feel the students are getting it, you space it out a bit more. And you should aim at something called interleaving. Books do, topic one and topic two. This is called must practice. But you make sure that whatever you are trying to, the, the most important things that you're going to teach, you try and teach in every single lesson or in every single unit at least. So if you decided you're gonna teach the present, the present continuous, so simple present, present continuous, I don't know, uh, present perfect, and maybe construction with model verbs that they feature in every single unit because that's the best way in which the brain interleaving. I call it interweaving.
because you are interweaving uh, whatever the topics are. So think about the most important things that you want to teach, that you really don't want your student to forget. Make sure you interleave. Make sure that these happen in every single lesson, even if it's just five minutes here and there, but they, they always are reoccurring. It's not just about space practice. It's also about the beautiful puppy called Freddy. Freddy is a puppy that's owned by a friend of mine. And this friend of mine one day approached him and said, John Franco, you study psychology, right? I said, yeah, a bit. So he said, well, something strange is happening to my dog. I said, what? Well, I'm training my puppy in my garden and I'm giving my puppy the instructions in the garden. And guess what? In the garden, he does them perfectly. But when I take the little rascal to the park, it doesn't follow my instructions. Why is that? Well, the same applies to our kids, guys. It refers to a principle called transfer appropriate processing, which says that when you learn something, when you learn something, the learning will be context and state dependent. What does it mean? But if I the puppy learned it in the garden, because I took into another context, it doesn't have the contextual cues to remember it. So if a student is learning something in the classroom, they might not remember it outside. If they learn something through a gap fill exercise, they might not remember it or use it as effectively when they're writing an essay. I remember a lady who came to me frustrated, an English teacher in Penang, in Malaysia. She came to me at the end of a session and said, John Franco, I'm teaching, I'm doing them loads of gap fill and they still cannot write. Because memory, learning is also task dependent. Task is a context, right? Same thing. I know you Muslims don't drink, but if I learn something when I drink alcohol, when I'm drunk, I won't remember it when I'm sober and the other way around. One of the first um, experiments ever made was with having people learn something underwater and, some, and on the beach. And then they'd ask the people who learn it underwater to recall it on the beach. And they couldn't as well. So this is very important, why? Because if I'm learning the perfect tense in the context of house chores or last weekend or the sports I did, when I move to another topic, the kids might not be able to do it because memory is context dependent. They will remember it with the words that you used for that unit. So recycling is not just about repeating. Recycling is about repeating through different contexts, learning through different contexts. So go back to the four, five, six things that you want your student to learn, that you really want them to learn because you don't wanna go back to them three years down the line. You need to put them in every single unit. So it's not just about repeating, it's about repeating in different contexts because memory works through association. We call it associative learning. You hook the new with the old. So if you're using Quizlet or any other app and you keep doing the same Quizlet many times over, the kids can recognize the words with Quizlet. Will they recognize those words in an exam paper? The more able will, the other want. This is called TAP, Transfer Appropriate Processing. I'm always, almost done. This is from my book, just to show you I put that I practice what I preach, we decided with my colleague Dylan Winales, this is Spanish, that these were the things that were uh, universals. Can you see how they keep reoccurring in every single unit? These were the verbs we wanted to recycle in every single unit so that we satisfy the principle of up. Remember Freddy, the pup. He taught me a lesson or two. Okay, guys, and uh, I will finish here because I think really the time, yeah, we haven't got much time. Just one more thing. 
look at this activity, it's called oral ping pong translation. Now it's for Spanish learners, sorry, for English learners of Spanish. So in your case would be uh, Arabic learn, Arabic speaking learners of English. So it would be different. But what is the idea? The idea is that you're doing something called retrieval practice. What does it mean? This is my approach in very simple terms. I model using those frames, those centers builder I showed you earlier. Then I spend at least two lessons doing a lot of listening, and reading, no speaking whatsoever. The only speaking allowed is reading aloud. Remember those reading aloud games. After that, I do something called structure production. What does it mean? It means that I get my student to say everything that I planted here, everything that I planted here. If I put here 10, 20 new sentences, I'm gonna make sure that every single one of them comes out. Why? Because on my TEFL, on my CELTA, I thought I was taught something which doesn't work with beginners. What was I taught? Give them open-ended questions. Why? Because it encourages them to speak. So say something, what did you do last weekend? So they can say whatever they like, anyone speaks, right? I think that's silly. Because if I give them an open-ended question, what are the lazy kids, the less motivated kids going to do? But even the bright ones, they will give always the same answers, right? They'll say, I went out to my friends or I went to the cinema, but, if you instead do something called pushed output, you really force them to say, you ask them very clear questions. You give them tasks, which force them to say every single thing you planted in your listening and in your reading, then you'll get to a point where your student will learn every single chunk you gave them. Oral ping pong. The students have different cards with the same English thing in this case, because my students are English learners of Spanish, but they have different parts translated and they're challenging each other. They're saying, hey, how do you say I like to play football because it is fun in Spanish? And partner two, who doesn't have the answer, need to come up with the answers. And it's a game. You got three points. If they say everything correct, three, 70% two, only the verb correct one point. It's totally student-led. It's retrieval practice because it forces them to say what I want them to say, which means that when they do this game with two or three, four other people, I will have been out of the scene, so I'm not doing anything. Yes, I had to make an effort producing this, but I'm not judging. So they are not being asked by the teacher in front of the classroom, it's them. They're giving each other the grades, and that's great because when I do this and other games that I cannot talk about, which are all pushed out, what happens? Then when I get to the next stage, creativity, when the students now can do open-ended question or task-based learning, here, they are ready because they've done loads and loads and loads and loads and loads of recycling or whatever you planted there. You're not going straight from a listening to a task. They're, they're fully ready. So the idea is the less is more. If you really want to recycle on steroids, super recycling, you need to make sure that you spaced out practice, that you recycle through different tasks across contexts, and most importantly, that you cut down the curriculum to the essential, because that allows you to slow down, to recycle as many times over. Don't follow the book to the letter because the book goes fast. The book is designed to make money. It's not designed to help your learners. Do you think that you can just use that little flimsy book to teach for a whole year? You can't. And why does it not have Arabic inside? You know why? Because then if they make a book, for the whole world, they don't need to translate it. So they come out with the idea, no, you don't need to use Arabic or Italian or French, no. Everything in English, 
all in the target language. But the kids will also ask you, sir, what does that mean? Always. So my advice to you is ignore that. And you know what? No, I see. I need to stop here because I only got. I need to go in the fifteen minutes, guys. I hope it was useful. Uh, I, I'm sure your head is hurting with all this psychology research and tips. So it's, it's, in uh, fact, it's I, interesting. It's what you what you shared with us is uh, we, we can uh, listen to you the whole day. It's great. Uh, the ideas are very interesting. Thank you, Aziz. So what's next? Are we going to answer questions? I only have literally yes. 10 minutes. Yes, uh, uh, we will uh, spend some time for questions. Uh, but before that, I have a uh, quick reaction on what you just have mentioned. Uh, so uh, you, you, the, uh, you said that we should focus more on collocation or, and uh, collocation. And uh, we should not teach, uh, you know, single words because this will prevent uh, learners from mastering uh, or uh, acquiring the language. And we should also focus on uh, listening uh, and reading, uh, because if we do so, uh, we, all the grammar items are there, are already there, so we don't need uh, to... Uh, uh, so uh, could you talk a little bit more uh, or in a quick way uh, on, uh, about the... Uh, what you mentioned as the phonological priming. Yeah, so the idea of priming is that the more you are exposed to the same sound patterns, the more you're exposed to something, especially if you, you make sure that your students are, you direct their attention to that specific um, phonological item, if you do it many times over, the brain is, of course, subconsciously being sensitized to those patterns. So when you go to teach it explicitly, the students are already halfway there. In fact, you find that a lot of the students will already know. So imagine, that you are doing every day um, in French, for instance, but you can do it in English too. You are doing an activity where um, you basically, what I call, spot the silent endings. Yeah? So you have words on the board and you, uh, you have, uh, for instance, the, the T in French, yeah, which is silent. And you say, guys, je suis content. Uh, what was the silent letter in content? Uh, T, sir. Okay. Okay, guys. Je suis content. Look at the board. Je suis content. What is the silent letter? E, sir. Now, imagine doing this lesson in, lesson out. Lesson in, lesson out. Five minutes a day. For five weeks, four weeks. Won't the kids be sensitized to the fact that the T and E are silent? They will, right? And when you teach them the grammar rule, they will need very little explanation. And this is important because what every single language educator researcher will tell you, you shouldn't spend time talking about grammar. You should spend time using the grammar. And priming, is an effect which is per 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 pervasive. It cuts across grammar, phonology, uh, syntax, anything. I'll give you an example. In uh, about 10 years ago, there was a famous experiment in which they asked some people to describe pictures that they were being shown by the researcher. And the pictures, interesting, the pictures were pictures that you would normally describe using the active voice. For instance, the dog bites the man. Instead, the researcher said, you need to describe it using the passive voice. The dog, sorry, the man is bitten by the dog, which is very unnatural, right? And they did it many times over. 
Then they ask the subjects to come back 20 minutes later. Now, 20 minutes is very important because I told you that things disappear from working memory after 15 seconds. So it means that if the people, the subjects will go back and describe that picture again using the passive voice, the experiment has modified long-term memory. So guess what happened? They called the subject back, they showed the pictures again, and guess what? They all described the pictures in the passive voice. This is called syntactic priming. What it means is, for language learning, this is an amazing implication. It means that if you do, if you bombard the students with the same sentence pattern, and then you ask them to speak, to answer questions afterwards, they are most likely to use exactly the sentence pattern, that chunk. Yeah. This means that your listening and your reading is modeling through priming. Imagine how important that is. It means that if you lose, if you do a lot of listening and your listening is highly patterned and highly structured and highly repetitive, you are likely to create students who can speak. Whereas what happens in a typical language lesson? PPP, presentation, practice, production. Don't do that. Presentation, listening, reading practice, one lesson, two lessons, third lesson, or even fourth lesson. I'll give you an example. If I say to a class, I've done it for, I taught French for 25 years. And typical thing that I was taught on my teacher training was this. You show the picture of a girl and you go, j'ai une soeur, j'ai une soeur, répétez. And of course, how many kids are gonna say correctly, English kids, come on, j'ai une soeur. It was like, j'ai une soeur, j'ai une soeur, <laughs> all sort of things, of course. Yeah. And then I thought, this is wrong. How about before they speak, I make them listen to j'ai une soeur, j'ai un frère, j'ai un, un grand-père, j'ai deux grands-pères, many times over. Are they likely to say more correctly? Of course. Come on. If you say although, although, how many kids are going to say although, although I'm tired, I'm going to go out? How many people are going to say correctly? But if you make sure that you do right as you hear it, faulty echo, spot the error, sentence puzzle, all these easy activities, listening bingo, which take two seconds to prepare, and the student listen to it many times over, they are phonologically, syntactically primed to say correctly. And when you become explicit in saying, although, means that you have to do the, the, like that, look, the, the, you won't even need to spend much time on it because they heard it many times over. And when you did that activity, write it as you hear it. And you ask them to write on the mini, on the books. How do you think although is written? You know how much conversation you're gonna have about language? It's gonna be a discovery uh, journey as opposed to, all right, Look at the phonetic symbol on the board. Oh, the, the, the. Like a lot of people are teaching phonics these days explicitly. You don't need to. Aziz, I need to go, unfortunately. It's 7.51. It was such a pleasure. I really Thank enjoyed you so Aziz. Much. You're such a wonderful person. I'm, I'm so, uh, you know, of uh, yeah. you and anyone like you who organizes this kind of things because, and I I joined, I loved it. I love to do it pro bono and I'm, in the future, as is, you can come in to do it again. Uh, I really Thank enjoy. So maybe so I can much. do the other part Thank of the. Thank you so pleasure. much for sharing Just, uh, all these uh, interesting ideas, and uh, we learned a lot uh, uh, today. And I'm sure uh, the audience have also learned uh, a lot of tips and ideas from your wonderful books. Uh, I'm sure that uh, that uh, the, uh, the the session was very interesting. Do you have any final comments for the audience? Quick. Yes, uh, one, one, one comment, which is, you know, it's at the heart of everything I do. My approach, EPI, extensive processing instruction, it's all about the idea 
that listening is at the core of everything. Be the teacher nurturer. You are there to model through speaking. Don't care if you're not native speaker in your accent. It doesn't matter. As far as it's decently pronounced, don't worry. Make it a conversation between you and the kids or better, better, making make sure that your kids are constantly interacting with you. Even if they have just a mini whiteboard and a marker or even a sheet of paper and they're writing down little dictations, little games like the one that I mentioned to you, make sure that you are bombarding them with the most essential things they need. Don't be too ambitious. Don't need to teach. It's better to teach less, but make sure that it really, really sticks that when they finish the year and they come back next year, those few things that matter are in there. Because remember that curve, the brain is limited. We yeah. can only process four things any one time and things last very, very little. Yeah. Less is more, less is more. Yes, thank you. Thank All you so much. Aziz. Thank you so much. Thank you, my friend, for inviting me. It was a pleasure. Take bye care bye. and have a good one. Bye, bye, bye. Morocco. Bye-bye. Thank you. Gracias.